in Matthew 5, 21. Last review last time first. So last time we um, spoke about Matthew 5, 17 through 20. We talked about what it means to fulfill the law and the prophets that Jesus talked about in verse 17 and 18. That Jesus did not come to discard any of the law of Moses, to get rid of it or treat it it doesn't matter. He came to fulfill all that it had to say about him. And some of that he had already had fulfilled when he spoke this verse that we see written down in the Gospel of Matthew. Some would be filled within years, and some still yet have not been fulfilled. As a Jew, he kept the law of Moses perfectly, like no other person ever had. He never broke one of the laws and was completely holy. But this doesn't mean that he expects us to do exactly what he did especially since we aren't Jews. Today, a very small percentage of the law of Moses can even be obeyed. And an even smaller amount is obeyed. Don't let people fool you when they call themselves followers of Yeshua and claim to keep the Torah. They're not telling you the truth or they're deceived. We talked about the New Covenant, when it started and what it means for us. We talked about where people go who break God's commandments and teach others the same. And really, no matter how how you interpret verse 19, we talked about it in depth last time, it's very obvious that God is against those who disobey Him and teach others the same, and He's for those who obey Him and teach others the same. How people take the Word of God and literally flip it around to say the exact opposite of that is absurdity at its worst. But it's obvious he's, like, he's for obedience and against disobedience. So never let anyone tell you that we have to disobey or teach you to disobey God as if it's normal and natural, because the Bible makes it very clear it's the exact opposite. Lastly, uh, last week we talked about what it means to have our righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees. Of course, first of all, you must have your sins forgiven. You're the one who kept it perfectly. You must have your sins washed away. If you don't do that, it doesn't matter how much you obey God, how much you offer up to Him, how much repenting you do, how much obedience you do to the law of Moses or any other law out there, it'll do you no good. You will never exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees unless you first have the shed blood of Jesus Christ applied to the doorposts and lentils of your house and you're cleansed of of your sins by His blood. So that must be the the first start, start you make, the first place you go to. However, it doesn't stop there. You must also not be a hypocrite like the scribes and Pharisees were. You must have obedience from the heart, unlike them. Uh, There are many ways we shouldn't be like the Pharisees who loved the praise of men and who did righteous things to be seen by men. And of course, you must obey God's moral law first and foremost, never putting your traditions or your preferences above the Word of God or exalting to the same place as the Word of God. We also talked about how we cannot make mountains out of molehills. We can't make little things big and big things little because that's exactly what the Pharisees and Sadducees did. So we must not be like them. We must exceed them in many ways. Okay, today we're going to start in verse 21. And read through verse 26. Jesus said, You have heard that it was said to those of old, You should not murder. Whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you, that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment. Whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says to you, Fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, And there remember that your brother has something against you. Leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. Agree with your adversary quickly while you're on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge and the judge hand you over to the officer and you be thrown into prison. Surely I say to you, You by no means get out of there until you have paid 
the last penny. We see in verse 21, Jesus referring to you shall not murder, obviously talking about the law of Moses, specifically the Ten Commandments, and the sixth of that commandment, you shall not murder. What judgment were murderers given for murdering? Death. They were put to death themselves. So I have no problem with the death penalty um, if it's, you know, exercised properly because God, in His law, given to His nation, His people, He gave them the death penalty for certain crimes. So I have no problem with it. Um, but that was the temporal earthly judgment, right? That's what they were talking about if you look in Exodus, I think it's 21 and 22. Of course, then comes God's judgment for murderers. Because let's face it, we live in a world where murderers get away with it sometimes, don't they? Get away with killing people. Sometimes, unfortunately, the wrong people are punished for the crimes. People sit in jail for a long time after they've done nothing wrong. So God has justice to come. Because God sees all. God can't be fooled. There's no one who can get away with from Him who's committed a crime. He doesn't need DNA tests. Doesn't need some smart detective. Doesn't need a jury or judges or police force. He sees it all. Now, he does have a police force. They're called the angels. But he doesn't need them to detect anything for him. Because he sees it all. And so, of course, murderers, according to Revelation 21a, will end up in the lake that burns with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. So it will happen to murderers. And according to Revelation 22.15, they'll be outside the holy city, the New Jerusalem, forever. Now, obviously, those verses are referring to those who, who repent of their sins. And the fact that someone has a, is a murderer, does that mean they can't be forgiven of that sin? It's a heinous sin. It's a heinous crime. It takes someone's life away. No matter what the means are of taking the life away. Now, I was reading through the Law of Moses today, and they were talking about, just, re, just reminding myself what it said, and it spoke about two men who were in a fight, and a woman got between them somehow, and she was pregnant, and she had to give birth prematurely. And it says that if the, if the baby is not injured in any way, no harm is done to the baby, then um, the man who caused the harm can receive whatever punishment the husband decides. But if the baby is harmed, it is life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. What does it tell us in our current environment here in America? That God sees an unborn baby as life. At the same value, the same level as a man. Because if that baby's eye is cost, you take that man's eye out. The same value as that man who has been living for a long time. who's full grown, fully mature. He's not getting any taller. He's fully developed. God has the same value upon the undeveloped life. Who is not yet born as the one who is fully born and fully developed. It's eye for eye, two for two, life for life. So God sees those who kill babies, even those who do it on accident, as murderers. What about those who do it on purpose? Even worse for them. Because in the law of Moses, if someone doesn't premeditate a crime, a murder, someone, and you will kill someone on an accident, there is less punishment for that. They can flee to a city of refuge. Maybe stay out the, their, their death sentence that might come upon them. But those who kill on purpose, premeditated killing, there's worse punishments for them. It's automatic death for them. But murderers can be forgiven. You know, we, we see the Apostle Paul, who called himself the chief of sinners. Why? Because he persecuted the church of God even to the point of death for some of them, whether he was doing it himself or leading them to their own death or approving their death, like with Stephen. Paul was forgiven, not only forgiven, but given a place of being the apostle to the Gentiles. So even though you know, murder is a heinous crime, I was talking to students about this at Kennesaw State this last week. They talked about how all sins are equal. I said, well, what do you mean by that? Are you telling me that if you kill someone, it's, it's just as bad as lie, lying to them is the same thing? No, if you lied to them, you can go to them and say, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have lied to you. I know maybe our trust is broken now, but we can work up our trust again. But if you kill them, you can't do that, can you? You've taken their life away. That's a more heinous crime, but God can even forgive a murderer. And so when we look upon people, maybe who haven't done as, as worse a crimes as we have, we maybe not have murdered anybody, 
You should look upon them as someone who God can save. Someone who God can redeem and forgive. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul. I don't, I don't know if there's any man alive ever who can say that they've been so zealous for the Lord like he was. All the things he did. I mean, you just read through some of his writings, all the beatings he took, the things he went through for the Lord Jesus Christ. I, I don't know of a man who's ever lived who's been as zealous as him. But like Jesus said, he who's been forgiven much, loves much. And the Apostle Paul realized all he had been forgiven of. So he loved much. And so those, those who have done heinous crimes, I mean, they can be forgiven by God. They've been given mercy by God. They can enter into God's kingdom as former murderers. Yet oftentimes, even when someone's forgiven of their sins by God and granted mercy through repentance and faith in Jesus, they still need to face their temporal earthly punishment for their crimes. And someone who's been truly born again, who's been truly saved and changed by God, understands this and is willing to face whatever awaits them because of the sins they've committed. Of course, there are situations even then that they're granted mercy, but that's, that's very rare. Very rare. In verse 22, Jesus says, But I say to you, some powerful words right there, but I say to you, because what's following those things, I say to you. See, when he says, but I say to you, I think he, he mentions a command of God and the law of Moses that was given to Moses and the Israelites by God. And he says, but I say to you. He's saying, I'm not just a man. I'm not just a prophet. I'm either about to change something or I'm about to add to God's law. But who can add to God's law? What man can add? I mean, show this verse to a Unitarian who thinks Jesus is a man, an exalted man. And ask them, well, who, what man can do this? What man can change God's law? What man can add to God's law? But God himself. You know, the scripture that proves the deity of Christ, if you ask me. And I don't think there's any way around it. But what right does he have to do that? Because he is God in flesh. He is the Son of God. He is Emmanuel, God with us. And he talks about here of someone who is angry with his brother without a cause. It's important that we have that there without a cause. And some of the texts that we have, the Greek texts we have, don't have that in there. I think that's a mistake. I think that shows that those texts are, are an error. Because anger in of itself is not wrong or sinful. Now, how do I know that? Psalm 7, 11 says God is angry at the wicked every day. God is angry every day. If anger is a sin, then God's a sinner. And God's not a sinner. We see Jesus Christ at least two different times, probably three, getting so angry he flips tables in his father's temple's courts because of what they're doing. He was angry, but he didn't sin. He's also loving, and God is love, but he's also angry. So anger is not a sin. And we see in Ephesians 4.29 it says to us, be angry and sin not. So we can be angry and not sin. So that's proof enough in, in itself, in my opinion, that anger is not sinful. However, be careful. Be careful. If you're judging some kind of anger you, you have had or have had or you're going to have, make sure you're being honest with yourself. Don't seek to justify ungodly, fleshly anger to give yourself a pass. Don't seek to use the Word of God to justify your sin. It doesn't work that way. Don't seem to justify getting angry about things that really don't matter. Temporal things that have no value. You know, I remember back when I was a sinner, I used to get angry when my favorite team lost the game. Or when the ref or umpire made a mistake. Man, what a foolish thing to do. How stupid was that? I remember back when I was a sinner that I used to get angry when I thought the person in front of me was driving too slow. Go through a little bit of road rage. Or someone driving maybe five miles per hour, in my opinion, too slow. And they wouldn't get out of my way. They, they didn't realize they're ruining my life because I was in some place one minute slower than I was. Because of them. Because it made a difference. Getting there one minute faster. It really did. Of course, I'm being sarcastic. I used to get angry when I would lose a competition or while playing video games. I used to get angry at my parents for punishing me for my wickedness. I'd mouth off at my mom. I think I've apologized to her like probably 15 years straight on Mother's Day for the way I was. And I'd punch holes in walls. 
right? Throw things, say wicked things, and how grieving it is to my heart now when I think of it all. With all that being said, there are causes to be angry about. Is anyone here angry about all the lies that have been told the last three years about the jab? I'm angry about that. Anyone here angry about all the babies still being killed in the mother's wombs every day? I mean, anyone angry about all the false teachers leading people astray? Anyone angry about the current federal government seeking to destroy our country as we know it? I'm angry about that. Things to be angry about. Anyone here angry about sin in general? I hate sin, man. So there are legitimate reasons to be angry. We just need to make sure that we do the right things with such anger. Right? Anger should not be expressed with outbursts of wrath or a lack of self-control. Anger should not be manifested with filthy language or taking God's name in vain, or even like the replacement words, right? Of taking God's name in vain. We shouldn't manifest them that way. Anger should never be manifested in violence. We shouldn't get angry about things that really don't matter. Anger should be under the control of the Holy Spirit. It should be submitted to God. It should manifest itself in a greater prayer life. It should manifest itself in greater actions to destroy the kingdom of the devil. Because he's the one who is the source of all sin, which is what, generally speaking, makes me angry. It should manifest itself in greater depths of holiness to make sure we don't become what we're angry about. It should manifest itself in greater knowledge of biblical doctrine to refute the lies of the devil. Truly, righteous anger won't be manifested in a sinful way at all. And if it is, you can't tell me it's righteous anger. You won't be able to convince me of this. So when someone is angry without a cause, just like the murderer, they're in danger of judgment. And this cannot mean the local judgment under Jewish men or the Jewish law. Okay? They had no right to court. I mean, as far as I know, there's no law against anger in the Jewish law. And oftentimes, anger is an inward thing. It may not manifest itself at all on the outside. Right? I don't have anything in our law, in our nation, that's against anger. You can be angry about something and can't, you know, no one will get arrested for it. So they had no right to, under the Jewish law, law of Moses, to judge anger. Unless, of course, it's manifested in some kind of physical way. Therefore, this must be speaking of God's judgment, which makes sense. Because God knows what's going on in your heart at all times. And he's able to judge it properly. Men oftentimes get it wrong. Men oftentimes get the actions wrong. Judging the action. What about the thing that's inside of someone? They get that wrong as well. But from the inner anger comes a progression oftentimes with seemingly worse judgments from God. The unrighteous anger manifests itself with words that ought not to be said to any man. Words that hurt. Words that you can't take back. That's why it's so important to have self-control. Especially when things are going around in your life that you don't like or aren't pleasing to you. It's so important to have self-control. It doesn't mean we can't uh, quote Psalm 14. One, it says here, it says, if you call someone fool, or it says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. But there's a difference between calling someone a fool like that and saying, well, quoting Psalm 14, one is saying atheists are fools. It's not name calling. It's just a declaration of the fact that God says that these people are denying the obvious that I exist. But remember, were this supposed to be done in, in the spirit of holiness? And as, but as, if someone goes down this path of saying such things they ought not to be said, it usually escalates and gets worse and worse in unrighteous anger. I've been there, I've done it myself. As I read this verse, I'm reminded of many situations from my past, whether either myself or seeing someone else doing it, my father, um, and understanding how it just escalates and gets worse and worse. It would start with some kind of unrighteous anger, move to nasty words being said, and then on to fighting words, what are called fighting words. Saying something to stir someone up to the point where they want to cause physical violence to come upon you. 
there may have even been a crowd around. I remember one one time when I was in high school and and this one guy was uh, talking about me behind my back and my friends told me about it and my friends were supposed to be my friends and his friends. And we went to the park afterwards to fight. And everyone was egging this on. Everybody. And I wasn't a Christian, but it's like I had a revelation. These people really aren't my friends. They just want to see a fight. They just want to see some bloodshed. They want to see two guys go at it and see someone get beat up. And the guy who they were egging me on to fight, he didn't want to fight. He was, he was running away. He didn't want to be, be there. He, just, he was actually begging me. And I, was, and I just backed off. I said, I, what am I doing? Why am I here? Why am I doing this? But when you're all stirred up in righteous and unrighteous anger, and these words are coming out of your mouth, and you just read, I mean, that's what happens. These people want to see a battle. And in such situation, we ever find ourselves in such situations as followers of Jesus, may we be found as peacemakers. I don't mean simply uh, trying to stop the fight. Well, that's part of it. I mean calling them to repentance for such anger and pointing them to Jesus for transformation while attempting to stop the fight. Just like we talked about weeks ago when we went through the Beatitudes it says in verse 9, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. The peacemaker there is not someone who sits between two countries trying to make a treaty. You understand? Like one of us went over to, to Russia and Ukraine right now. We're able to get them to sign a treaty and stop war. That wouldn't make us a peacemaker, biblically speaking. You understand? A peacemaker is someone who helps people find peace with God through repentance and faith. But in the end, when people get unrighteously angry... If they don't repent of it and submit it to God's control, they'll end up in hell fire. That's what it says. And in verse uh, 22, where it says, To you fools shall be in danger of hell fire. The same judgment, ultimately, as the person who murders. And this is the, the, the uh, distinguishing I made with the students at Kennesaw State recently. This is how all sin is the same. It all sends you to the same place. You understand? All sin will. So God will judge your heart, and God will deal with you. And this is what Jesus is trying to communicate to you here. He's going further with it, like I said earlier. But I say to you, he's taking it further than just the act of killing somebody. He's judging the unrighteous anger of your heart, oftentimes manifested with the words that come out of your mouth. And he's judging it as wicked. He's saying you need to repent of it. Verse 23 and 24. Therefore, remember your gift. If you bring your gift to the altar and there remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and offer your gift. And of course, this is all about relationships, isn't it? Because you oftentimes, people oftentimes get angry at people. And even the sin you get, people are committing it. Right? So it's all about relations being destroyed through anger, which is very easily done. Whether it's marriage, whether it's children, parents, siblings, friends, co-workers, or even complete strangers. You have a relation with everybody around you. Relations are different. I said with my wife is different than with anybody else here. I said with my children is different than anyone else here. My relationship with, with Brother Kevin is different than everybody else here. You understand? There's different relationships going on, different levels of relationship, but anger can destroy it all. Unrighteous anger. There's different dynamics in relationship, but nonetheless, they are still relationships. You just make sure you're not doing anything sinful to destroy them. And anger so easily destroys these relationships. We don't want to be the reason that someone rejects the truth because some sin we have committed against them. And so they all, all relate have some level of importance, especially when it comes to sowing seeds and seeing people saved. We want to be blameless. We want to have our hands free from the blood of others. And if you've offended somebody, if you've caused legitimate offense on someone because of your sin, you need to do what, it's, what, you, what it takes to make it right. Whatever it takes. Don't treat it as if it doesn't matter. Don't treat it as if it's no big deal. God wants you to deal with it head on. Not sit back and be apathetic 
and be indifferent and delay, but to take action, to take care of it properly and thoroughly, as much as it depends upon you. It's a serious thing for them. You're in sin in such a situation. That's pretty serious for you too. So obviously if it's affecting your relationship with them, it's pretty serious for them, no matter what it is. You may see it as small, they may see it as big. Beside the fact that you're in danger of being chastised for your sin, if you're causing problems in a relationship, you're also in danger of dying to stay and going to hell. Besides that, God also does not hear or pay attention to the prayers of those who are in willful sin, according to Psalm 66:18. He calls you to humble yourself and repent first. I mean, think about it. Sin is not only an offense to people, it's an offense to God. So when you sin against people, you're also sinning against God. You know, oftentimes in prayer, we make requests of God. Sometimes we sit and listen. Sometimes we worship God. Sometimes we make requests of God when we're praying. But why would God give us anything if we're constantly offending Him? Why would He bless us with something if we have some kind of sin in our lives that's offending Him? This is what James 4.3 calls asking amiss. And it's definitely a hindrance to answered prayers from God. So if you sin against someone else, you've also sinned against God. And there are ramifications for this. Causing destruction in that relationship. Possibly driving that person away from Jesus. Your own salvation possibly being on the line. God not paying attention to or answering your prayers or blessing you. It's important that we seek our... We examine our hearts this morning and seek God about this to see if we're legitimately done wrong to someone. And if we have, to humble ourselves and repent. Verse 25. Agree with your adversary quickly while you are on the way with him. Lest your adversary deliver you to the judge, the judge hand you over to the officer, and you be thrown into prison. I surely I say to you, you will by no means gather there until you have paid the last penny. So, of course, this goes beyond offending a brother or someone you have a positive relationship with. It goes on even to those who are your legitimate enemies. There is no exception. We have no right to even treat our legitimate enemies in a wicked way. In fact, many times, this is the most powerful way to reach your enemies. By returning love for their hatred. Blessing for their cursing. Oftentimes it's the most powerful way to reach your enemies. When you love them and give them blessing, it can soften and melt their hard, cold hearts of stone. It can prepare their hearts for the seed of the gospel and lead to them getting saved. Turn to Romans 12. Verse 14. It says, bless those who persecute you, bless and do not curse. And then in verse 17, repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. If it is possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. And for in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. If he were to continue to read in Psalm 25, it would continue to say, and the Lord will reward you. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And so, when we go back to Matthew 5 here for a second. When Jesus is continuing on, it talks about your brother murdering someone first and continuing on, making the law deeper and stronger, how you relate to people you know. And then it talks about your enemies. There's no different how you relate to them. You love them all. You should treat them all in a righteous way. You don't have unrighteous anger towards any of them. You're pursuing peace with all men as much as it depends upon you. Not them. No matter what they do, it doesn't change what you should do. You should always act in a righteous way towards people. So we see these people are enemies. And Hebrews 12, 14 also says, pursue peace with all people and holiness, without which no one will see the Lord. 
So it's important that we pursue peace with people. We don't make people our, our worst enemy than they already are. Okay? And it's so important to remember this, especially as we go to the streets. Right? Because we're encouraging, we're, we're encountering much opposition on the streets. Especially if you're going to the LGBT stuff. Lots of opposition there. Lots of violence, lots of anger, lots of hatred. And one other thing to consider, friends, as you're going out and doing these things is, you know, you're, you're experiencing some kind of anger they have towards you in a moment, but you don't know what they're going through. You don't know what's going on in their life. You know, they obviously are doing something that's against their nature. If you're talking about the LGBT, they're doing something against nature, it's shameful, it's vile, their conscience is convicting them about it. They know it's wrong. You come along and agree with their conscience. And they're trying to get rid of their conscience and defile and corrupt their conscience. Everybody in the world to agree with them and make them feel better about themselves. And you come along and disagree with them. And so it's good to have compassion on such people because you don't know. You know, oftentimes people who are involved in such stuff have, have been sexually abused in their life. Haven't had a parent there in their life. You know, and you come along and you're telling the truth. That's what you should be doing. Remember, when they respond in such ways, have compassion. Help, help, ask God to help you see them through his eyes. He sees it all. You know, he sees it all. And so if, but if this person who's your enemy, back in Matthew 5 now, the person who's your enemy, and you've legitimately done something wrong, you're in trouble now. Right? You're going to the judge. You better be thrown in jail. Don't be puffed up in pride. You understand? Humble yourself. Don't think because that person is your enemy, God's going to deliver you out of their hands when you've done something legitimately wrong to them. No, oftentimes God will let you sit in jail for a while, get you to humble yourself, get you to admit you're wrong. Because even your enemies need to see if you've done wrong, you're willing to admit it. You're willing to humble yourself. How can you expect them to humble themselves and repent of everything they've done wrong to God? When you don't repent of the one thing you didn't run to them. You know, they get to see a picture of, of God, of God's grace, of God's mercy. You know, that, that, you don't, uh, that you don't claim to have never sinned, that you don't have, there's nothing that you've ever done wrong, but you have, and you're willing to admit it. And oftentimes that will humble their heart, that will soften their heart, and open up to the truth, even though you've legitimately done something wrong to them which you should have done in the first place, but it's done now. So deal with it properly. And God is saying here, Surely I say to you, by no means get out of there till you have paid the last penny. And the word penny there is quadrant. It's one sixty-fourth of a day's wages. That's a very small amount. And so I make $640 a day. That's $1. Or $10, $10. That's nothing. Not many people here make $640 a day, right? I know I don't. But it'd be $10 for that person. So God is being serious. You need to deal with these things. Whatever relations you have and the people around you, even your enemies, deal with those relations properly. Make sure you're being humble. Make sure there's no unrighteous anger, no vengeance in your heart towards these people. Because God will deal with you if you do. Okay, we'll stop there for today. Does anyone have any questions, objections, or things you want to add? Now's the time. Yeah, I was going to thank you, brother. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask you, you clarified at the beginning, you were talking about uh, murder, and you were talking about babies. And, and I don't know if I heard you correctly or not, but you were... You were you were saying that killing a baby, even by accident, was considered murder? Was yeah, so, so in the Law of Moses, that's what I'm referring to, there's two men in a fight, yeah. and the men who are in a fight aren't, aren't intentionally trying to kill the woman or harm the child. I can just, we can just go there and read it. It's in Exodus. Twenty Exodus twenty one verse twenty two. Exodus twenty one verse twenty two. If men fight, 
and hurt a woman with child, that she gives birth prematurely, yet no harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as the woman's husband imposes on him. He shall pay as the judges determine. So that's the one who, who's hurt uh, the child and the woman accidentally, right, but has not killed them. Um, and then in verse, that, actually that's with no harm follows, it says in verse 22. But if any harm follows, then he shall give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, wound for wound, stripe for stripe. And so it's almost like as if God is treating the life of that child as more precious than a regular man. Because if you continue to read on in these laws concerning violence, that if you kill a man accidentally, you can flee to the city of refuge and run away. That's not the case in the case with an unborn child. So I'm not saying as our law of the land that we consider it that way. I'm saying in God's law, that's what he said. So if, if any harm follows, and obviously, I mean, I'm assuming it's done accidentally. He's not intentionally trying to hurt him. There's two men fighting. If men fight, that's what it says. And so any harm follows, it should be life for life, eye for eye, two for two, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn. So if, if the baby is killed, that man's life should be taken. Um, but if no harm follows, there's still a punishment. So verse 22 says, No harm follows, he shall surely be punished accordingly as a woman's husband imposes on him. He shall pay as the judge is determined. So when men are fighting, and women try to break them up, they even need to be careful. That should, that should actually cause them, this law should cause them to break up if a woman gets between them. Especially a pregnant woman. The man's in greater danger now. Right? So that's what I was referring to. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, the context is isolated to this, yeah. not, not to like right now, like if someone... No, no, that, that was the kind of stuff I was talking yeah, about, yeah. 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 yeah, I'm not saying if someone in our modern day kills a child in accident that they're... I would see that as murder. No, 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 but, but in this context of Jewish, Jewish law, it says what it says. Gotcha, gotcha. Yeah, yeah I, just, I, I, I was just wanting to clarify. Yeah. Clarify that. Amen. So while our society does not protect the child's life and sees it as trash for the most part, God goes above and beyond to protect it even more. Yeah. Of course, none of us would want to kill a baby on accident. It's just uh, if something happened, yeah. nobody would think that God thinks you're a murderer for doing that. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I agree with that. Amen. Yeah. Isn't the law blind? Accidentally kill a protected animal. Oh yeah. <laughs> you go to jail. Why? Even yeah. On yeah. Even it's on accident. I think. Yeah. If you're on purpose, you get like a huge fine. Yeah. The bald eagle that's are like upwards of two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Something like that. And not only that, I mean, in our in our modern day, a lot of places where abortion is still legal, if you kill a pregnant woman and baby dies, it's double homicide. Yeah, it is. Even in Jordan. So it's very contradictory. Double homicide. It's ironic. Well, the verse 25 here, it says, uh, agree with your adversary quickly while you're still with them. Mm -hmm. um, when, when I read that, I kind of get the, the idea that Jesus is saying that if you do do something wrong and you, you recognize it immediately, conviction of the Holy Spirit, you act right then and there. That's right. Before you even get delivered to the judge. And That's right. If you do, you've already done it in major almost with it. That's right. right? Yeah, and it should be immediate. Yeah, sure quickly as possible. Yes, that's good. Was any sin? Mm -hmm. Any sin in your life, you just deal with it thoroughly, immediately, or quickly. Gotcha. Yeah, right. for sure. Remember, it's kind of interesting how uh, when you just read and Exodus, it says, yep. you know, burn for burn, wound for wound, strike for strike, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot. I kind of read it backwards, but yeah. Um, it's interesting how it's like. You know, like you said, obviously you take, you know, because I'm, I'm pretty sure there's people out there that have had, like, you know, multiple abortions, but um, it's kind of fearful, like, you know, obviously they're not getting any, you know, judgment for the most part in this world. That's right. But, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you measure the, not only the cost of one life, but multiple lives, you know? And, you know, it even goes much further, like, you know, you know, murder that have, Taking lives of countless people, you know, like for instance Hitler, like millions, you know, just just gone. It's like right. it's really you know fearful to think, like, because obviously, like God, he sees life as precious, and and it's really 
interesting to think about that. You know, like if you, if you can't even uh, you can't atone for your own life, right? So it's like, you know, how could you like what would await someone that that is, you know, take life of countless many, you know, and even even just two, you know, like trying to put in perspective, like just two two mm-hmm. lives, one life, you know, you can't even can't account for one life, so it's like like what type of uh, judgment that would be on, you know, mass murderers, you know. Mm-hmm. And really uh, interesting. Yeah, it's one of the things I used to reason with the women who were going to kill their children at abortion clinics. Yeah. yeah. They think it's just a get in, get out, life's back to normal, but they have to deal with their conscience. Mm-hmm. You know, and if to make yourself feel better about killing your own child, you have to defile your conscience. Well, that's going to affect your conscience in every area of life. Then you start doing stuff that you never thought you'd do, and feel not even feel bad about because you, you just try to get over killing your child. You know, things you, before you did that, that act, you wouldn't have done otherwise. And so there's de- definitely, and a lot of them who've been there several times, they, I know this because they say it with their own mouth, they seem really far gone. Yeah. And you kind of have to, at that point, you kind of have to just make up, because obviously God gives us a conscience and in order for you to commit, you know, to continue to, you know, corrupt it, you know, that's, you have to like lie to yourself almost. Oh, so, you know, this isn't a big deal. You know, it's like, you tell yourself that at first, and then, you know, when, you're, when you start to feel that guilt, it's like, you know, have to give you more lies to kind of, you know, suppress that, you know, your guilt, and it's just like, wow, you know? Yeah. I mean, even in a situation like we read in Exodus, um, in a modern-day situation, if two men are fighting, one gets between them, and one guy punches the woman in the stomach, and the baby dies. I mean, there's going to be some guilt there, even though he wasn't intending to kill that child, he wasn't so unrighteously wrathful and full of anger, that wouldn't have happened. Sure. Right? So it's the same kind of situation. Kind of like drunk driving. I mean, I, I remember, I was like 10 years old, 9, 10 years old. Me and my friends were playing in the neighborhood, playing some baseball, wiffle ball on the, on the street. You know, the whole thing, car, and you get out of the way, and you come back on, you play some more. There's one guy who I was playing with, I don't remember his name at this point, I wasn't real close to him, his sister was on the sideline, and she ran away from her mother and got run over by a car right there in front of me. And that guy, I mean, he was going a little fast in the neighborhood, but even if he did it on accident, he's still got to deal with that, that, that inner guilt for that. That maybe he wasn't paying enough attention. Maybe the mother wasn't paying attention, but there's still something to deal with there. Now you're talking about people doing it on purpose and who, who can't... Who, these babies could not be killed unless... The mother gave permission, right? Big difference. That'd be the equivalent of that situation I'm talking about, where the mother threw the child up into the road, run over by the car, right? Like, like, uh, remember uh, Stephen Curtis, Chap- Curtis Chapman's uh, son he drowned, didn't he? Huh? Did he drown? Is that what? No, oh, no. Oh, okay. He, he ran over his baby sister. Oh. He was just in the car, didn't know that she was playing. Had right. No idea. He was just—he—he's he, an honorable son. Yeah. So his family is honorable, and they've adopted many children from China. Mm-hmm. Um, we know them kind of from adoption era, but uh, Shoho Ministry—they—they they, they do a lot of work in China. But uh, his little baby daughter or little baby sister was behind the car, had no mm-hmm. idea, and he was—he was like. Uh, just driving out. Right. And she died. That an example. Yeah, it's like someone, you're not doing it on purpose, that doesn't see you as a murderer, of course. He's going he he to deal with that. He had, and he did, he had trauma and grief and years to, to deal with. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think uh, actually, um, Stephen and his wife, that they wrote a book about it, mm. uh, about the, this, this thing that happened. Okay. And all that God had to do and, and everything. Because it, it took years for, for their son to get Sure. There. Can imagine. Uh, but he wasn't a murderer. No, he wasn't a murderer. But he I'm just had, no. So it wasn't a, a, his conscience striking him as mm. if he did evil. Right. But he still uh, just be made in the image of God. I have to deal with the reality of it. Deal with the, the grief and the sorrow right. and the, you know, to and only the Lord could bring him through that. Yeah. You know, without the Lord, people people without the Lord, they don't they don't turn to the Lord in those situations. They might commit suicide. Mm-hmm. For sure. Yeah. For sure. I, I mean, I have an example from my family. My, my uncle, um, was one of my favorite uncles growing up. My mom, my mom has five brothers. 
I had quite a few uncles, but um, when he was in his early 20s, he went out clamming with my, with my grandfather, the one who I'm named after. A big storm hit, tossed their boat over, and they're both trying to survive, and, and my grandfather actually grabbed onto him. For my grandfather to save himself, he was grabbed onto his son, and he was drowning his son in the process. And so my uncle had to push him away to save himself. He lived with that all his life. Oh, and then he died. He died. Oh. Just like the day after my parents got married. And that's that's crazy to, to think about that. And that's a, that's like a different level than what we we're even talking about. It wasn't like on purpose. So he kind of saved himself. So it's kind of in there somewhere in the gray area. But he's he's. I mean, I think he's dealt with it all his life. Like he has like you know depression like no one else in his family has. Just dealing with that one thing that he had to do a long time ago. The only other option he had at that point was to, he would drown his father would survive. And he wasn't a Christian, neither was my grandfather that I'm aware of. And it just. Did he, did he become a drunkard? He had problems drinking for a while, yep. He sure did. But it, 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 it affected every, every relationship in his life from there on out. You know? Where's he at now? You shared with him. I've shared with him so many times, man. There's times he's been very soft to hear the Lord. A lot of times he seems hardened. Has he ever brought this, this thing up? Never. Okay. Never, man. The only way I know it is I've asked my mom. Because I, I wonder, I, my, I was named after my grandfather and I wondered what happened to him. And, my, and I didn't even know all the details until like maybe 10 years ago. And so I knew he had drowned and my uncle had survived, but I had no idea the details of what happened until like maybe 10 years ago. That's how, you know. That's, that's, that's. Probably still there, the enemy's got, got, sure. got that. Almost no doubt in my mind about it. Yeah. Yeah, if you guys think about it, you can pray for him. His name is Danny. Yeah. But guilt, a, it's a big thing, man. When it comes to the stuff of, of murder and our words and how we use our words, and um, it's important that we don't kill relationships through these things. You something you want to say, bro? Yeah, I was actually thinking of uh, an interaction that happened like a year or maybe a year and a half ago with this homeless man that me and Brother Matthew, um, I think at the time, Chandra and Tatiana were there with us, but um, he, he started talking to us about, um, you know, wanting stuff and we told him the gospel and stuff and you know, he started opening up, and I think at the time he was kind of on drugs, so not completely sober-minded, but he was still there somewhat. And so we got to deal with his conscience, um, or at least address some issues, mainly sin. And he started opening up about his, his past and that he doesn't believe God can forgive him because what he's done, he, he actually, not to go too much in detail, but it just kind of, uh, touch on some main points. Um, I forget how many siblings he had, but when he was growing up, his dad, um, he was very abusive uh, to his mom his, his, uh, and even sexually abusive to his sister. Um, and him at the time, you know, obviously as a sinner, he wants to try to bring justice, but he does it in a very ungodly way. Um, you know, just constantly happening over and over again with him and his sister and his, his mom. And so, uh, he, I think he said he stabbed his dad like 16 times. And he, he actually didn't die after that. Um, but I think a year or two later, uh, he died. And he, in his mind, he thinks it's due to that. Um, I forgot the details why he said that, but, um, when he was, he was in tears after um, we talked to him, but you know, I was just reminding him that there is hope. You know, there there's hope. Jesus can forgive you. And I brought up, you know, um, Paul and all of that, and how he murdered, and the Lord used him mightily. But y'all bringing that up just made me remind uh, remind me of him, and I wonder where he's at now. Um, but. But yeah, guilt is definitely a real thing. Because I think the reason why it's homeless is due to that, you know, that one thought of his past. Yeah, sure. Yeah, for sure. <clears throat> yeah, the enemy gets a hold on that. Probably, oh, yeah. you know, not every sin is the same. Right. Some are more heinous than those mm-hmm. more heinous ones. Yeah. They become a stronger stronghold 
Yeah. yeah. Why don't they all turn to the Lord? For sure. I was like, you remember the, the old guy in breeding that I, they used to go witnessing to? Mm-hmm. And uh, he was in World War II. Mm-hmm. You remember right there? He brought the gun to our house. Huh? The one who brought the gun to our house. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. But Isaiah would go over to his house and sit with him and witness him. And uh, but he would he would say the same thing. I've killed. You don't know what I've done. Right. You know, it came out. I've killed a lot of people in right. World War II. Right. And God can't forgive me. Right. Mm-hmm. And no matter what persuading, no matter what was shared, yeah. no, he can't forgive me. Yeah. I've murdered people. I've murdered people. Yeah. You don't understand. Yeah. And it was just strong. It's just so strong. And then it was, he, you know, the enemy was at work in his life, and Isaiah would go over there, and he, then he thought that the enemy was able to give him some suggestions. Right. Thought that Isaiah, what was it, that Isaiah broke his VCR or something like that. Okay. Yeah, something at his house or something like that. But he was actually fixing it. He actually fixed it. Mm-hmm. He actually, he, then he came to the, to the house. He's an old, he's like 90 years old. He came to the house with a gun. He's looking for Isaiah. <laughs> I, had to re- I had to reason with him that no, you don't want to, you don't want to do that. <laughs> but you know, I had to reason with him. But you don't want to add another murder to to your rap sheet. Yeah. Right. God wants to forgive you of all the murder you committed. You don't want to do it. And at that time, actually, I remember at that time he softened at the door. He actually started softening and was open up to about this whole subject in his life. And if, you know, the Lord used it, but yeah. Paul. That's a, Paul. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I remember that whole story, bro. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that's that's interesting too, because like how you said that brother, like about how the enemy is probably like really, you know, using that to keep him. Because like I imagine like like if he if he would have turned to the Lord, just to, like and I'm obviously I don't know that, but if, like he would have turned to the Lord, just like what a big impact that would have been. Because as we know, the Lord that. You know, you know, as you said, he forgives much. Mm-hmm. No one's forgiven much, loves much. Mm-hmm. So it's like those, those people who are, you know, in heinous, like who committed heinous sins and are just you know, right. deep, deep down in the pit. It's like those people, man, doesn't want to get saved. Like probably even more than you know, right. who haven't done very much at all. But right. it's yeah. like because those people are the ones that go, they go crazy. Like obviously we all love the Lord, but they go, you know, they're on their level. So mm-hmm. you know, and they're the Pauls. Yeah, the Pauls, <laughs> yeah. like. Like, you know, yeah, imagine like... Like a Muslim uh, terrorist could say. Yeah. Right, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. They're going to be radical. <laughs> or like someone who's an abortion doctor yeah, right. mm-hmm. could say, yeah. you know? Yeah, so, oh, yeah they're, they're not just going to, they're not just going to get saved and just, just go, you know, they're like, their their ministry is going to like, they're going to go for the Lord, you know, like, mm-hmm. grow a heart for the Lord, you know? And, and you know, sometimes the enemy can actually use that conscience that God has given us against us. Like, for instance, I have True. a family member I won't really, I don't want to get too in detail, but... I heard from another family member that apparently they got drunk and did a hit and run and killed, might have killed someone, but isn't sure about it. And that person to this day, I talk to all the time about the gospel, and they've actually fallen into easy believism because of it. And the guilt that they have has caused them to, to hear the enemy's voice and thinking that no matter what they do, they're always saved. Right. And, and no matter what I convince them of, is it like you can't just believe you're you're okay with God because you haven't repented of something. Right. Right. Has, you haven't been washed clean of it. You just think that it's okay to enter God's kingdom dirty. I'm like, that's, that's another quote still I've seen. From yeah, the enemy can take it either way. It can make you feel like you can't be saved at all. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Or make you feel like you just can't overcome it. Just Like you're saved when you're not. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's true. Yeah, I've run into lots of soldiers through the years who've had that same kind of guilt that guy had that was not in the 90s, where they have a hard time forgiving themselves. I've talked to women who've had many abortions who've gotten saved. They have a hard time forgiving themselves. And still on their, their conscience, their mind, even though they know God's cleansed them and God's forgiven them. And it's good to live a life of no regret, as much as it depends upon us.